a second major sociological thinker um, uh, of this moment of industrialization was Emile Durkheim. Um, Durkheim is the really kind of one of the founders of sociology in part because he was, he called himself a sociologist, which is um, maybe a strange way to think about someone who's a founder of sociology, but um, uh, he was deeply interested in creating a discipline, a discipline of sociology that would be seen as a rigorous science. Um, and sometimes in the French tradition that Durkheim was a part of, um, the, the people who were setting up sociology thought of it a little bit as social physics. They, they referred to it as social physics. And what they meant by that you know, was you know, physical properties of bodies and how they move and relate to one another. But really it was sort of an attempt to say, the study of society can be scientific. Now, Marx got into a lot of debates about method and how it is that we should study something. But Durkheim, and to a degree Weber, takes this to a very different level, a whole new level of analysis. Um, and, and they begin to, to sort of create a foundation of sociology which is based both in a um, set of ideas or concepts, but also a set of methods that they think are absolutely essential in order to properly understand a society. Um, and Durkheim's desire to produce within um, sociology uh, a rigorous science led him to focus on what he referred to as social facts. Um, and Social facts were those things that exist outside of the individual and put constraints on our behavior. According to Durkheim, the individual wasn't the appropriate unit of analysis or level of analysis for society. One's person behavior could be an exception. Instead, we needed to look at broad social patterns. And so, you know, for Durkheim, this broad social pattern argument led him to sort of say that there were things called social forms out there. Uh, one of Durkheim's most famous books is called The Elementary Forms of Religious Life. And in that book, what Durkheim is arguing is that religious life exists as a kind of form. It has a, a basic architecture to it. And that that form is the thing that we as social scientists should study go a little bit into the weeds here and do a little bit of like a historical analysis, which may be more than some of you want, but I think it's kind of useful. Um, this idea of a form exists really in a long historical tradition of thought. Um, we see one of its earlier formulations in Plato, the great Greek philosopher, um, where Plato thinks about the ways in which there are forms in the world to which any one instance adheres to the overall form, but it doesn't perfectly represent the form. So let me give you guys some examples of this. I want you to think for a moment about chairs or trees. It doesn't matter to me, we'll pick one or the other. Let's just pick chairs for a moment. There is a form that is called chair. And the idea is like, you can think about this literally, like there's literally a form like a, a, a form that makes up a chair. But no chair perfectly represents the form. Many chairs are rough examples of it, but lots of chairs look very, very different than one another, right? They look kind of like profoundly different than one another. And yet they all adhere to this basic form that allows us to recognize them as chairs. Or think about this just a little bit differently. Um, you know, in school, if you walk into a classroom and it's the first day of class and you've never been in that classroom before, when you look at the classroom, you don't say to yourself, what are all these things? Instead, you know that there's a table and that's something that people sit around and that there are chairs and that those are things that people sit in you have probably never seen that exact table before, nor have you seen those exact chairs, and yet you know what they are, in part because they adhere 
to this abstract or ideal type that is a form. Now here I've introduced just a tiny bit of Weber because Weber is going to talk about ideal types. But the idea is that there are abstract concepts within which any one case of a thing roughly fits but doesn't perfectly represent. We have similar things with trees. We know what trees are, like you can see them. There's a form that is a tree, but no tree perfectly represents the form, even though all trees can be subsumed under it. So what would this mean if we're doing an analysis of a society? Well, we could say religion has a form. There's some structure to religion. So just like there's a structure to chairs, they have a form, religions have a form. And no one religion is going to perfectly represent the form that is religion. But our task should be to understand the form. So we might use particular instances of religion to understand the more abstract or pure form under which all religions are subsumed. So our task as sociologists is to begin to think about what are the different forms in society and how is it that different instances of those forms help us better understand the overall form. So what is the form of the family? The family is an institution or organization that has a form to it. No family is the perfect representation of family. Instead, we might look at lots of different family structures to better understand the form. For Durkheim, what this meant, and we'll talk a lot more about this when we get to both the culture sections and the religion sections of these lectures. So for Durkheim, what this meant is that in order to understand, say, religion, you could look at any religion. You could look at religion in Aboriginal communities in Australia. You could look at religion in China as it was practiced at different periods in time. You could look at the emergence of the Catholic Church and its overall structure. And even though every single instance of that would be different, they would all still adhere to the overall form. So think again to the chairs. I'm partially saying religion is like chairs, or I'm partially saying that you know, religion is like trees, insofar as you can look at any one tree and begin to understand some parts of the form, but not all of it, because the particular tree isn't going to be the perfect representation. So what do scholars do? Well, some scholars look at one tree, and they tell us a lot about that tree. Other scholars look at another tree, and they look to tell us a lot about that tree, and then we begin to combine these insights to create a general understanding of treeness or what the form of being a tree is. Similarly, in a study of society, some scholars will look at families in one context, in another context, and in another context. This could be in different parts of the world. This could be in different historical moments. It could be, you know, kind of in, 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 in extreme cases and we'll begin to extract lessons from each one of these so that we can begin to have a better conceptualization or theory of what family looks like and that that family adheres to an overall social form. This then is how Durkheim envisions sociology as a science because what it does is it comes up with an abstract principle of a form that is a pure type of the form that exists as a social fact, as a kind of fact that instances within any one particular society or historical moment will adhere to. Interestingly, those social facts um, for Durkheim um, uh, can be pathological. So Durkheim argues that there are normal and pathological sets of social facts. Normal social facts, meaning things that are consistent across all societies, and pathological social facts, which are in the particular society, it's an extreme deviation from the form that is highly irregular and not likely sustainable. 
here, Durkheim's example to me is really beautiful because it, it, it runs in tension with what we would think about as the distinction between the normal and the pathological. Durkheim's primary example here is crime. And Durkheim argues that crime is a normal phenomenon. I'm going to repeat that. Crime is a normal phenomenon. Why is crime a normal phenomenon? Well, for Durkheim, he says crime is a normal phenomenon because it's something that we see existing in every society across lot, like every historical period. There's never been a society without crime. And so we should think about crime as something that is normal. Now, Durkheim here doesn't mean then when he talks about something as normal that crime is something we should simply tolerate or promote, but instead it's something that we should expect. It's something that societies actually produce as a normal form of everyday social life. What does that mean? Well, you know, take a step back from your current conceptualizations of what crime is and think for a moment like Durkheim. Uh, what Durkheim would say is, well, there are norms or expectations in all of societies. And insofar as we create norms or expectations, normative expectations, expectations for how people should act, what we in part also create is deviance. We create a context wherein people will likely deviate from that behavior. So that all societies create expectations of behavior, but part of creating an expectation of behavior is also constructing deviance from that behavior. And if we cease to regulate normatively um, uh, uh, the sets of things that we want people to do, if we cease to enforce the boundaries of norms, the thing that was the deviation ceases to become a crime. Right? So crime can disappear because we no longer enforce a norm. But crime in the society doesn't disappear. We just have a new norm. We have other norms that we also enforce. So let me be less vague. Let me try and give you a concrete example. Um, homosexuality in uh, the United States used to be a crime. It used to be illegal to do. And there was a normative expectation of heterosexual behavior. So the expectation was that people all were supposed to be heterosexual. And if you were not, it was a crime not to be that. And um, in this sense, you know, the normative expectation of uh, heterosexuality in part produced the crime of homosexuality. Over time, and you know, kind of more rapidly over the last 30 years, that normative expectation has declined and we ceased to kind of enforce the regulation of the behavior. So there was a social struggle, a fight over this. And basically there was this push to no longer think about um, a compulsive heterosexuality or to think, well, you know, homosexuality is, is something that is wrong. And what effectively happens here is that the loosening of the normative commitment ceases to make homosexuality a crime. And here I don't just mean in the legal sense, I mean in the social sense where it becomes increasingly acceptable. And so you have this transformation of a phenomenon from something that was criminal before because it was against a normative expectation to something that is perfectly legal now. Um, and in fact, you know, with in the United States, marriage equality or the allowance of gay and lesbian couples to marry, you have a fundamental transformation of this. So in this sense, a set of normative expectations produced crime or deviance, and the relaxing of those expectations eliminated the crime or the deviance. Um, and, and now it's not that there's no crime in the society anymore. It's just that there are other expectations that we have that continually produce crime or deviance. And they, they're likely to change um, over time. 
uh, they're likely to shift, but the form will always be there. So we don't really care what the crime is. We just care that there is crime. And in different societies, we're gonna see different instances of what constitutes a crime and how that crime is a deviation from the normative expectations of a society. So different societies will have different things that they define as crime, but in every society we will see crime. In this um, uh, uh, conceptualization then, crime is a normal phenomenon that exists in all societies. However, crime can be pathological. And by that, what we mean is that there could be excessive crime. There could be too much of it. There could be sort of crime that exists far and beyond what it is that should happen. And in that case, in that excessive instance of crime, we may have a pathological society. So societies that excessively regulate norms, that create tons of crimes, where like every little thing is a crime, the idea or the form of crime in that society could be pathological. Durkheim is ultimately, as we'll see over the course of these lectures, a theorist of moderation. And he's going to argue again and again that you need some moderate degree of regulation of people and some moderate degree of the integration of people into a society. And that that moderation of regulation and integration is essential to understanding any one society. And that if the moderation, uh, if, the, if the integration of people is too excessive, either in terms of people have too many social connections or not enough, you have a pathological social form. And if the uh, regulation of people is excessive, if you like demand that everybody act in a particular way at every moment in time, think about the military, for example, or if the regulation is non-existent, there are no things that are regulating you, then you have a pathological social form. So crime is a normal phenomenon insofar as it exists everywhere and at all periods in time. But the fact that crime is a normal phenomenon that exists across instances doesn't mean that there couldn't be pathological instances of crime, ones which were truly excessive because there is no crime because everybody who commits a crime gets murdered, right? That's a really excessive thing. Or there is no crime because we exist in a society where we have no expectations for one another. So we'll see again and again how Durkheim is interested in moderation. And we will return in future lectures to this idea of integration and regulation as critical things that Durkheim will push us to be interested in. Integration, meaning how tied are we to other people? And again, he's going to say moderation, moderation, moderation. You need to be kind of tied to people, um, but not too tied to them. And you need some ties, like you can't be absent them. And then regulation, how strong are the normative expectations of you? Think about yourself and your friends. Some of you live in households and families that are highly regulative. They tell you everything that you have to do and other people live in households that are not very regulative. The family is like, eh, I don't know, you can go out if you want, we don't really care. Those differences in regulation regimes are also could apply more extensively to a society. Here, and I wanna to return then to a second concept of Durkheim, um, which is not just social facts and the normal and the pathological, but also the second critical insight that he provides, which is um, uh, uh, solidarity. And for Durkheim, solidarity is how people are connected to one another. And Durkheim argues to return to the beginning of this class, that big demographic boom, that there are two kinds of solidarity, mechanical solidarity and organic solidarity. And very roughly, we will say that mechanical solidarity is um, uh, that context of earlier societies, and organic solidarity is that context of more contemporary societies. Now, um, this is going to run a little bit against what the two words would in, like make you intuit. Uh, and so I want to spend some time on this. Um, but really, what Durkheim is interested in here is, like Marx and like Adam Smith, 
the division of labor. He's interested in the ways in which the division of labor um, uh, leads to different ways in which people in a society are connected. You should see some parallels to Marx here because Marx argues that the connection between people within a division of labor happens between workers with some alienation and between workers and capitalists as a form of conflict. Durkheim's gonna take a different approach and say, you know, the division of labor fundamentally transforms how it is that we relate to one another. Where in earlier, or what he calls in an anthropological sense, more primitive societies, the division of labor is more mechanical. And later, or in more advanced societies, the division of labor is more organic. And that these are two different forms of solidarity mechanical solidarity and organic solidarity. So what does he mean by this? Well, um, often students think about mechanical solidarity as the more advanced form, but it's not. And so I wanna just walk through um, why that is. So what is a mechanical object? Well, um, you know, I have here um, before you, my phone, so you can see my, like, this is my cell phone, and this is a mechanical object. And what does that mean? Well, it partially means that all of the units are deeply interconnected, or are, are tied to one another, and the functioning of the object is conditional on every element. Or a better example would be a watch. Let's say I have a watch before you, and the watch is a mechanical watch, so it has the gears in the watch. What happens when I remove one of the gears? Or for my cell phone, what happens when I remove one of the chips from my cell phone? Well, what happens is the object ceases to work. The object no longer functions very well or, or at all. So if I remove one of the gears to my watch, my watch is broken. It doesn't work anymore. By contrast, think of an organic body. So I am an organic body, right? And I have, you know, hair as a mammal and I have limbs and, you know, fingers and eyes and, and, and things like that. What happens in an organic body if you remove some of the elements? So let me just very quickly, I don't have a ton of hair, but there we go. Yep, I just pulled out a little piece of hair. So I removed an element of my body. What happened to me? Nothing. Nothing happened to me. I mean, I have a little less hair. I didn't have that much to begin with, and I have less now. It, it, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter that the hair is gone. We could have more extreme instances. I might get into an industrial accident and lose my finger, right? So this finger is gone, and now I only have four fingers, not five on my right hand. What would happen to me? Well, I mean, actually, it would be kind of consequential for me because it would be hard for me to type, but like, I'd actually be fine. I wouldn't be like the watch, which like just doesn't work anymore. And this leads to a kind of insight for Durkheim, which is that like in organic systems, nothing matters that much. Like no particular part of the system is absolutely essential. Sometimes there are. I mean, obviously my, my central organs, my heart and my brain are absolutely essential. My liver is absolutely essential. My kidneys, I could lose one of them. Doesn't really matter. My appendix, don't need it at all. My intestines, they could be smaller. It might have some health consequences, but you know, if I had to have part of them removed, it would be fine. In general, organic systems are incredibly robust because no element matters that much. Now think about this not in terms of a watch or a physical body, but in terms of a society. In mechanical systems, every unit is basically the same and every unit is necessary or, and deeply tied to one another. So they're deeply integrated with one another. Whatever happens in one place has deep effects on all of the other places. You remove one of the units, the thing doesn't work anymore. Interestingly, mechanical solidarity systems, according to Durkheim, are places where individuals don't exist. There are no individuals in mechanical societies. 
Instead, there's just the society. So, um, you know, and this in a society would be where every person is tied to every other person and everybody who you know or are tied to is tied to everybody else. So think about a family for a minute. Like, you know, there's the members of the family and everybody knows everybody else. So the people that you are connected with are also connected with one another. Or think about a friendship clique, like a, a, a group of friends that is a kind of a clique is one where you are tied to one person and you are tied to another person and those two people are tied to one another. And so you get this dense interconnectedness that happens. Well, in, a, in, a, in what Durkheim referred to as a primitive society, everybody is connected to everybody else. Every unit is tied to one another. So if you look at the structure of the ties, they're basically deeply, deeply intertwined. In other words, in Durkheim's words, people in those societies are highly, highly integrated, meaning they're deeply tied to all of the other people. In organic societies, people are not closely interconnected. Those of you listening right now have never met me before. You likely don't know anybody else who's listening along. You, or, or watching along. Like you may know some of them, but the vast majority of them that you don't know, at the end of this course, you will probably never see me again. We are not at all integrated with one another. And yet, and yet we may be more robust. We may be more robust insofar as none of us are necessary, insofar as you remove any element of the body and it's actually kind of fine. Here, Durkheim begins to think about systems of integration and regulation. Integration is how tied we are to other people in our community, and regulation is how strong the rules are that, that, that like manage our behavior. I'll repeat that. Integration is how tied we are to other people in our community, and regulation is society's use of rules to manage behavior. These are two things that Durkheim's going to be deeply interested in. And in mechanical societies, he's going to say, there is a high degree of integration. Everybody is tied to everybody else and your community. And in organic societies, people are not closely connected. Think about cities as a critical example of a lack of integration. You're tied to some people in the city, but the vast majority of people in the city you are not tied to. I live in New York City. I live in Manhattan. There's, you know, I don't know how many people are in New York, not that many compared to, you know, um, other growing major cities today, but let's just say there's 10 million people in New York. I might know 500 of them. I am not integrated at all into the life of the city of New York. But New York may be super robust in part because of that. And so, I want to return a little bit to psychic ideas of the ways in which within increasingly organic societies, each unit becomes less and less necessary. As the division of labor increases, each one of us becomes less and less necessary for the functioning of the whole, less and less integrated potentially to other groups. And we might begin to ask how it is that we feel in Marx's terms, alienated because of that or removed from that and how we can moderate some of the pathological effects of the lack of our integration into a society in cities. We'll return to this idea again and again and again to think about why it is and how it is that we can create, in some ways, mechanical systems within organic society or instances where we are integrated within some subgroups in robust ways so that we feel connected within a broader social system that is more organic. This could be things like labor unions, professional organizations, volunteer groups, et cetera, different ways in which we're integrated with a group where we feel connected. The final insight I'll leave you with Durkheim is that fascinatingly, Durkheim kind of argues that 
as each one of us becomes less essential in the kind of broad integrative regime of a society, as we move towards systems of organic solidarity, we become more and more obsessed, interested in, or like the, the uh, I'll just say more and more obsessed with individuality. So the concept of the individual really emerges in organic systems. Now, part of this is because in mechanical systems, insofar as everybody is tied to everybody else, everybody's equivalent. Nobody has a unique structural position because everyone's structural position is exactly the same as everyone else's because everyone is tied to everybody else. So their position within a network of people is the same. Within organic systems, everybody is kind of unique because I have my own distinct set of friends that other people don't share. But interestingly, we might think about what it means that in a society where we become less and less essential for the functioning of that society, the society may become more and more robust. So as an individual, I become less necessary. As a society, we might become more robust. But importantly, as I become less and less necessary, my sense of my own distinctness or my sense of my own individuality increases. It's an interesting concept we're going to play with a lot more in the lectures to come.